One forgotten the widows of the Irish Revolution. In the aftermath of the 1916 Rising, the British government executed 16 men. Seven of them left behind wives and children, many of them still very young. Now in the decade of St. Tineries, much has been said about these executed men, but how many of us know about the women and children that they left behind? The women were Agnes Mallon, the wife of Michael Mallon, Lily Connolly, the wife of James Connolly, Grace Plunkett, wife of Joseph Mary Plunkett, Grace's sister, Muriel McDonough, wife of Tomás McDonough, Kathleen Clark, wife of Tom Clark, Anya Kant, wife of Eamon Kant, and Maud Gone, the wife of John McBride. These seven women were from a variety of class, ideological and educational backgrounds, spanning the breadth of Irish society at the time. And yet they had several things in common. They all lived through the hell of Easter week and were widowed at the same time, left to pick up the pieces. In his last hour on earth, Eamon Kant wrote to his wife, Anya, to tell her, men and women will vie with one another to shake your dear hand. You will be, you are, the wife of one of the leaders of the revolution. But the reality for these women would be radically different. Much about their stories isn't unusual. Theirs is the social and political history of many women as Ireland moved from revolution into the new free state. The widows of Easter 1916 didn't die for Ireland. They had to keep on living for Ireland. What would this new free Ireland be like for them and for all women? Would it actually have a real place for them in it? In many respects, the 1916 Rising represented a high point of the idea of equality for Irish women. And nowhere is this more evident than in the Proclamation of the Republic, a truly radical document that addressed Irish men and Irish women, insisting on equality of the sexes, freedom of religious expression, and equal economic opportunity. To quote it, the Republic guarantees the religious and civil liberties equal rights and equal opportunities of all citizens. This was the proclamation that these women's husbands had given their lives for. This and the republic that it declared Ireland to be would become a touchstone for the widows for the rest of their lives. Time and time again, they would hark back to it and remind others of it too. But following the executions, the women also had other things on their minds. Can you just tell me, Sinead, about the immediate aftermath for the widows? You're still in this very fluid situation, but the husbands have been executed and they, many of them have small children. I mean, it was, it was absolute chaos. I mean, Dublin is destroyed. The, you know, the gas to the city had been cut off. The, you know, there's that whole um, sort of reaction to what's happened. They're all plunged into a, a, a public realm. Their houses have been raided in most cases. There's mass arrests. Immediately after the Rising, many of the widows were plunged into a struggle for survival. All of them, with the exception of Grace Plunkett, had small children to feed, and only Maud Gone had independent wealth to fall back upon. The family of Lily Connolly, for example, wife of executed leader James Connolly, was left destitute. A letter survives written by Lily Connolly's daughter, Nora Connolly, in which she recalls their circumstances at the time. We were in dire straits, she wrote, we had no money whatsoever and no means of getting any. Daddy never had any money to spare. The last few pounds he'd had in his wallet were taken from him after his arrest. You know, many of them didn't have the opportunity to earn money because of the nature of Irish society at that time. But even for those who did, for example, Anya Kant, who ran a private fee-paying school, she came back to her home after the Easter Rising 
Her husband had been executed. She had dependents to look after, including a child. And that school had been ransacked and destroyed. So her source of income was gone. Her husband was gone. And she was left with no support in the immediate aftermath to try and deal with that reality, with her own grief, with her own loss, and also the lack of any financial support. Widows, as with other single mothers, had very little access to the workplace, they, they had issues of childcare. Many of them had to rely upon charity and philanthropy as there wasn't any welfare. Just how harsh life could be for widows and their families at the time, and how limited their options sometimes were, is illustrated by the holdings found in the National Archives of Ireland. So the National Archives preserves the memory of the state. So we hold all of the records that relate to the modern Irish state in terms of government records from 1921 onwards. But we also still do have holdings relating to the period when Ireland was under British administration. So really the holdings tell a range of stories in terms of the political stories, the social stories, the economic stories, the cultural stories that shaped and framed the nation in effect. So really, Orla, before 1922 and the foundation of the Irish state, apart from charity, what would a widow rely on in terms of relief or welfare? Very little, really, the workhouse. At the time, workhouses were the only official help available to the destitute. In the workhouses, families were separated from each other and conditions were often grim. As a result, only the most desperate, those who had no other choice, would go there. We have ledgers here in the National Archives from the workhouses that very clearly show that it's widows who are turning up. In each line, you've got widow, 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 oh. widow. Pretty bleak. Many widows faced destitution and the workhouse, following the loss of their husbands, who were often the sole or main breadwinners. The families of the men involved in 1916 were no exception, and an immediate charity drive was started to help them. There's initially fundraising to provide assistance for the widows of those killed in the Rising, and also for those who were jailed. And this becomes the Irish National Aid and Volunteer Dependence Fund. And it's really fronted and initially administered by the widows, particularly Kathleen Clark and Anya Kent, they start fundraising, appealing to the people of Ireland to raise money to support the prisoners and the, and the families of, of men who were, who were killed during the Rising itself. This grows into a really successful, charitable, welfare-driven organisation that raises money all over Ireland, across the Irish diaspora. And the money that's raised in Ireland is, of course, dwarfed by huge amounts that come in from America in particular. And is in, in that, that fundraising initiative, um, are, is the story of the widows part of the propaganda used? The widows are sort of front and centre and the children in, in this propaganda to raise the money. The story of the widows of 1916 and their children became a powerful tool for raising public sympathy and money for their families. But it had another effect on them too. The widows, despite their own intense personal grief and financial struggles, had to get used to the glare of the public spotlight. In the wake of the 1916 Rising and the execution of their husbands, there was significant international and national interest in them and their children. Indeed, the nationalist movement had to exploit that interest in order to both change the initially hostile reaction to the Rising, but also to bring in much needed funds so that the movement could regroup and continue. As a result, the women found themselves at the forefront of the nationalist publicity effort. Remember, this is during the First World War, so the British state has very heavy censorship. You've got the defense of the realm act, Dora, so the newspapers are heavily censored, so you can't do anything political in them. What you can do is much more emotional and appealing to the emotions, talking about the lives of the men or the lives of their widows. An example of this is the 1916 Christmas edition of the Catholic Bulletin that featured pictures of many of the 1916 widows and their children. 
The photographs in particular that are included in the Catholic Bulletin subvert the censorship because people take the photos afterwards and use them as, as part of the fundraising drive and use them as, as pamphlets about the rising. It must have been very tough to have been so much in the spotlight at a time of such intense grief. While many of the widows threw themselves wholeheartedly into raising awareness of the cause that their husbands have died for, some of them reacted to the intense scrutiny in subtle and unexpected ways. The American newspapers pick up the stories of the widows of 1916, particularly the romantic story of Grace Gifford and Joseph Plunkett. Grace and Joe had been married in a last-minute ceremony in Kilmainham Jail. Within hours, he was executed, and she never saw The publicity generated by the widows and their children was crucial in bringing public opinion around behind the 1916 Rising. But women actually played a much bigger role in sustaining the nationalist movement itself. So after the executions, the, the movement has been essentially decapitated. There's martial law and there's censorship. Things are really in disarray. The widows really step in. Kathleen Clark had been really given a succession plan by her husband, who was head of the Irish Republican Brotherhood Military Council. She had a pot of about three or 4,000 uh, pounds, and she really starts the ball rolling. The key to all this was the Irish Volunteer Dependence Fund was really the only public face of what becomes the independence movement. And it really becomes kind of a parish by parish national organization at a time when there is no Sinn Féin political party, when there is no other ways of getting involved in the independence movement. And everywhere across the country where you have these activists gathering, they eventually become kind of the first branches of Sinn Féin. And they're predominantly led by women, and the widows are really kind of at the, at the coalface of this kind of organization. Which is really important because you've got a moment here where things could have died. It could have been successful, the executions and the imprisonments of these men. As you say, they could have decapitated this movement. Do they bring in new characters and new people? One thing that Kathleen Clark does is uh, she hires an administrator. And Anya Kent is also involved in this hiring decision. And the person they choose is Michael Collins. Michael Collins had been released from prison at Christmas. Um, he has IRB backgrounds. The decision to hire Michael Collins is really key to his development as a nat. Were particularly vulnerable. They often lost the support of their families, their claim to being respectable, and their social status making it even harder to survive on their own. A last-minute wedding in Kilmainham on the eve of Joseph's execution could have been a way for Grace to avoid such a fate. In 1917, the National Aid Committee paid for a holiday in Skerries for several of the 1916 widows and their families. Present were Agnes Mallon and her children, Lily Connolly and her children, Anya Kant and her son, Muriel McDonough and her daughter, as well as Grace Plunkett. While there, tragedy struck Muriel. Well, she went swimming. Although Muriel is a really, really strong swimmer, had won awards for long distance swimming, the area of Skerries is, is, is notorious for, for, for currents. And she was trying to get out to the island. She'd been told by others not to go to the island. Grace raised the alarm very quickly because one of the children, um, Seamus Mallon, had, had run back to the house. And so it was very immediate and they were very alarmed from, from the outset. But unfortunately, when the boat went, there was no sign of her. And, Tragically, her body was washed up the next morning and obviously she had, she had drowned. It all happened so quickly, uh, even with all, with all the families there, it must have had such an impact on them all. But most of all, of course, Barbara, her little daughter and Donna, 
her son who was in hospital at the time. What happened to them afterwards? I suppose the, the story that, that I recall first and foremost is that, that Don was lifted up to the window in the hospital and he remembers looking out of the window and seeing horses with the black plumes dancing on their, their head and years later it, it came back to him that he was watching his mother's funeral. After the McDonough children were orphaned due to the execution of their father and the subsequent drowning of their mother, the National Aid Committee became involved in their welfare largely as a result of something that Thomas McDonough had written when he declared, my beloved Muriel and my beloved children, my country then will treat them as wards, I hope. The National Aid Committee was the same fundraising organization that was set up to look after the families of those who fought in 1916. It decided to take a very literal approach to McDonough's words. In his last letter, Thomas McDonough has used the, the term wards of the nation and this phrase that he uses because he's using it in the context that he hasn't made much money and so he's, he's making the case for them to be looked after by the wider nationalist community. But instead, the National Aid set up a committee to, to look into the, you know, who's going to look after these children. The issue of who the McDonough children should live with was complicated by religion. Muriel's family was Protestant, while the McDonoughs were Catholic. At the time, sending Catholic children, especially the children of a dead nationalist hero, to Protestant families was highly disapproved of. And then it becomes a pull and push between both sides of the family. And the children are moved from place to place. And, they, you know, and so, so their lives are, are turned upside down by almost the possession of them by the nation. This was during a period when religion was assuming an ever-increasing importance. This is illustrated by the fact that every single one of the Easter widows ended up Roman Catholic. Four of the Easter widows were initially Protestant, and all four converted to Catholicism. Maud Gon McBride converted in 1903, just prior to her marriage to John McBride. And she wrote to W.B. Yeats around that time, describing herself as an Irish woman. She said, I want to look at the truth through the same prism as my country people. I want to convert to Catholicism. In the case of Grace Gifford, from the Unionist, Loyalist Gifford family, her conversion happened just prior to her wedding to Joe Plunkett in 1916. Lily Connolly converted to Catholicism in August 1916. In her case, she was fulfilling the deathbed wish of her husband. The last of the widows to convert to Catholicism was Muriel McDonough, and in her case it was in May 1917, poignantly the first anniversary of her husband's execution. In many ways they were embracing the faith of their executed husbands, but more than that it underlined the increasing association, intertwining of nationalism and Catholicism around this time. In 1917, things changed for many of the women involved in the nationalist movement, including some of the 1916 widows. Many of the men who had been imprisoned in England after the Rising began to return home, changing the status quo. So while the proclamation in 1916 had the promise of equality and gender equality for women and men in it, after many of the men begin returning home in 1917, it becomes apparent to a lot of the women that they're going to have to uh, advocate for themselves. The men now are the political movement, the men are coming back, and the women are fighting really hard to say, we are also part of the political movement. In the general election of 1918, the first election where you're going to have women voters, albeit over 30 with certain property qualifications, Kathleen Clark really wanted to run as a Sinn Féin candidate, but she is stymied by the men. The men wanted to put in the men that are still in prison uh, and the male heroes of 1916 into those seats, and, and Kathleen was sidelined. Uh, and you begin to see this, this is happening again and again, that sidelining of the women. And so even a widow like Kathleen Clark has to battle for her position. This pushing out of women from the public sphere was a theme that would continue into the new Irish Free State. But first, Ireland had to win her independence from Britain. In 
In 1919, the War of Independence broke out in Ireland. The Republican forces were determined to carry on what was begun in 1916 and strike a decisive blow against the British Crown forces in Ireland. During the War of Independence, what happened to these families, um, to the women, to, the, to Kathleen Clark and her children and, and, and the other widows during this period? How active were they and how, how difficult was that period for them? It's women who've come from a, a, um, a more political background that are the ones that have become more involved. Like Kathleen Clark, who's a justice in the Republican court, for example. She's also a member of the Second Oil. You've got Anya Kant living with her sister Lily. You know, their house in Oakley Road must have put up half the men, the prominent men in the movement, they, they gave safe houses all the time. And they, of course, then are well known for having done that. Grace Plunkett is much more somebody who hasn't been particularly active, but what she is, is a very skilled artist and cartoonist. And that's her talent. And that's what she's used during the War of Independence to great effect. Um, in terms of propaganda? As, as part of the propaganda movement. Lily Connolly is elected in, in the local government elections in 1920 and becomes a local government councillor for a period of time, but really is never involved in, in the movement. She's got young children to look after, and I think a lot of her time is, is based on survival. She gets money and hopes to set up a boarding house in order to keep her and her family. And that's, that's a really important... And that's quite a common thing for widows, isn't it? Establishing yeah. boarding houses. It's, it's something that you can do where you live um, and, and look after your children. A major feature of the War of Independence were violent raids by the British Crown forces on the homes of women and children. The first thing the family would hear would be a loud bang on the door, and that would quickly be followed by armed men entering the home, pushing and physically assaulting the people inside, who invariably were women and children, smashing up the house, highly personalised attacks, mementos of their husbands being taken, so every time the loud bang came on the door, there was of course the anxiety, there was of course the worry. Is that the time you're going to get killed yourself and your children are going to be left without you having already lost their father? The Crown forces knew who they were raiding. They knew these were the widows of the Easter Rising's leaders. And that was played out in the way in which these attacks happened. The home of Eamon Kant's widow was raided by the auxiliaries in February 1921. They took away Sinn Féin flags. They took away what they described as seditious literature. They also took away what were described in a report as musical pipes. I take that to be Eamon Kant's Illen pipes. But it must have been quite emotionally traumatic for her to have these belongings, this, I suppose, relic she had of her husband taken from her by the Crown forces for no reason. What, what, what did they think? They, these were some sort of weapon or something? Even women like Agnes Mallon, who isn't involved, is raided several times. And the fact that she has the memorabilia from Michael Mallon's time in the British Army, like his ceremonial sword, um, that, things that they're trying to hide, things that they don't want to be taken away um, because they're, they're keepsakes and mementos. So just because you're not involved doesn't mean that not you're not going to be harassed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you, you're, you're, you're a name. You know, for, for the widows who had young teenage sons, there was, of course, the danger that they would be killed. People had been killed during raids uh, on multiple occasions. Sometimes 10 times in the one week, there would be raids and violent raids on these homes. So it was this almost inexorable punishment for the widows of the Easter Rising leaders and their families that really continued throughout the whole War of Independence. The War of Independence ended with an offer of a treaty by the British in December 1921. This treaty offered Ireland the status of a self-governing dominion, but not a full republic, as declared in 1916. 
Immediately, this treaty caused outrage among many nationalists, including the widows of 1916. The attitude of the widows of 1916 was one of horror and rejection and disbelief. They had fought so hard to get so far, and now, as far as they were concerned, their leaders, who were all men, uh, were selling them out. I think that they were very much dedicated to upholding the ideas of the Easter Rising and the proclamation. All of their husbands had gone out to fight for those ideals. Many of them had been executed after putting their names onto the proclamation, which promised full sovereign independence and equality, basically, across religion and gender lines. And so I think that they took those ideals very seriously. And all of the women say they were not fighting for uh, dominion status. They weren't fighting to be part of the British Empire. They were fighting for a republic that was going to give them equal rights, equal opportunities, equal suffrage. And that was what was so important to them. Pro-treaty political leaders basically try to pigeonhole the women as hysterical, as bloodthirsty, as demanding vengeance, essentially being irrational. That's how they explain it. Here's a quote from P.S. O'Hegarty, who's a real prominent uh, supporter of the uh, pro-treaty side. Uh, he said, quote, they have become practically unsexed, uh, their mother's milk blackened to make gunpowder, their minds working on nothing save hate and blood. Wow. So that really gives you kind of a flavor of this kind of visceral reaction to the women and this idea that somehow it's, it's their gender, which is irrational. But what's actually going on, do you think, there? So what they're doing here is they're taking their, their status as widows and basically saying that they can't possibly be rational because of this loss they've suffered. It's a real neat political trick to take your opponent's greatest strength and turn it into their greatest weakness. Civil war broke out in 1922 between the pro-treaty Free State forces and the anti-treaty Republicans. All the widows of the men executed in 1916 took the anti-treaty Republican side and immediately began to pay a price for it. Moygan McBride, Kathleen Clark and Grace Plunkett were all arrested at various stages in 1923. Moygan famously went on a 20-day hunger strike. And Grace Plunkett, who was arrested in February 1923, was lodged in Kilmainham Jail, the very place where she'd been married seven years before, the very place her husband had faced an execution squad. Many of the children of the 1916 widows were by this stage old enough to take part in the anti-treaty side against the Free State. They, too, were arrested at a time when the Free State was starting to execute prisoners in reprisal for attacks on their forces. Seamus Mallon is the son of Michael Mallon. He's the son of Agnes Mallon. He's arrested. Sean McBride is the son of Major John McBride, the son of Maud Gunn. He's arrested. Ina Connolly, Nora Connolly, Roddy Connolly, the children of James Connolly and Lily Connolly. They're arrested. And all of those people are subject to potential execution. We know that Sean McBride could have been executed, but for a decision by the Free State that it would backfire on them to execute the son of an Easter Rising leader. The same with Seamus Mallon. But that didn't do anything to allay the fears of their mothers during that time. So there's a tremendous irony in the experience of the widows of 1916 across the entire revolutionary period because all of the widows of the 1916 leaders take an anti-treaty position. It is remarkable how quick the pivot comes and they now become enemies of the state. They become enemies of a state that in many ways was born out of the sacrifices of their husbands. They become enemies of a state that continues to invoke the names and the memories of their husbands while viciously attacking their widows. The Civil War ended in 1923, with the Free State forces winning. However, they now faced the challenge of building a new state. 
The new Irish state, like many others, struggled with a real increase in widows and orphans after almost a decade of conflict. Indeed, many Irish contemporaries saw how the state was going to treat widows as a test of what kind of country it was going to be. As one official commented towards the end of the 1920s, it was a real source of shame to see Irish widows parading their poverty, forced to beg from charities and various sources to scrap together an income. We know that widows were the single biggest category in need in the new Irish state, but we also know that the assistance they received was rarely enough and often ungenerously given. The evidence for the new Free State's first attempts to deal with the problem are found in the Military Service Pensions Collection in the Military Archives in Dublin. The Military Service Pensions Collection is an archive of uh, interrelated administrative file series recognising uh, the service of those who fought uh, during the Irish Revolutionary period. It is the biggest collection in existence covering that, that period of time. Starting in 1923, the Irish Free State enacted a series of legislation that granted pensions to certain people who were wounded and the dependents of people who were killed during the Irish Revolution. Qualifying for a pension was often quite difficult. The difficulty in getting pensions is really set by the restrictive nature of the legislation. And there's not a lot of money to go around. It's a massive aspect of this. Uh, it, the, you know, the Irish Free State starts poor. You can see that had a pension been given to everyone, the spending would have been completely out of control. If we were, and I quote here, these are not my words, uh, if we were to give a pension to everyone who served a cup of tea during the war of independence, it would be untenable, basically. So they are restricted. Many applicants had to go through a difficult process to prove their military service, their financial circumstances, and that they were who they said they were. There were often long delays before an application was rejected or approved. For the widows of the dead uh, in 1916, they are set apart from the very beginning. Yet, there are still delays, there are still frustration. We have a letter, for example, on a James Conley file from General Mulcahy, who was then Minister for Defence, basically asking why is it taking so long? And I quote, it shouldn't take one day to verify that James Connolly died in 1916. And it shouldn't take one day to verify that Lily Connolly is his widow. What's, what's the wait? What's, what, you know, so the frustration is there also on their side, but it is a lot more straightforward. The pension process was more complicated for Agnes Mallon. Even though her husband Michael Mallon was executed in the aftermath of the 1916 Rising, he hadn't actually signed the proclamation. As a result, Agnes and her family were treated differently to the widows and families of those who did sign, and she got less money as a result. The signatories were ones who were singled out as being the widows of the nation, if you like, um, and the ones who got more uh, compensation for the death of their husbands. So it wasn't really based necessarily on need, but on, on a kind of status. Agnes Mallon had a really difficult time. She had very little money. Later on, she does work. You know, she works as a night nurse. She works as a school truancy officer. But she's always, throughout her later life, in difficulty for money. While we know quite a lot about what happened to Lily, Grace, Anya and the other widows, because they were the wives of the men executed after the 1916 Rising, what about the thousands of other women who became widows during this period? What were their experiences, losing their breadwinner and possibly having small children to raise? The widows ran the risk, if they asked for help, of having their children taken into care and possibly sent to an industrial school. In the end, we can't know about all these stories. But the stories of the 1916 widows give us at least an insight into the human dimension of bereavement during the early decades of the 20th century. During its early years, 
the new free state had to grapple with a lot of instability. It needed to restore order as quickly as possible, and it also needed to assert what its new identity was going to be. In terms of morality, for example, and behaviour, what, sort of, what sort of sense do you get about what people were expecting or hoping for the, from the Free State? The Free State had to reassure the conservative elements in society. To the church, you know, the morality that you've traditionally upheld is our morality. We determined to do the same. We'd be a lot better than the Brits ever were at this. Like any nationality, the Irish people thought they were better. And the English, you know, had this Anglo-Saxon materialism. Um, they were, you know, they were very corrupt. They were very low morals. One of the ways the new free state differentiated itself was by leaning more into Catholic ideology. This impacted in several ways. Increasingly, nationalist and Catholic identities were becoming one and the same thing. And central to maintaining this identity was a particular idea of the family. The new Irish Free State is very much centred on the family and there's a particular type of family where there's a male breadwinner and women are primarily within the home. And the way that that is endorsed is through legislation which is really influenced by Catholic social teaching. So divorce is made illegal, even though it had not really been an option for many women and men prior to that. Women's bodies and their reproductive rights are being curtailed laws are used to ban the sale of contraceptives. What this is doing is curtailing women and it's putting forward a very idealised version of the Irish family. And so the free state that is set up, it is very conservative. Uh, social values are predicated on class and middle class values. For the widows of 1916 and for all of the political women who had campaigned through uh, cultural nationalism, feminism, uh, militant nationalism. This free state is not the state they wanted. This is not the state that they had fought for. In many ways, the state that came into being was a huge disappointment to them. But a lot of them realize that they have to continue fighting and they do that differently. This is, they do it through social activism, they do it through uh, local politics, they do it through uh, campaigns on healthcare, on social housing. And then you have women like Kathleen Clark who do it through national politics, uh, firstly as a TD and then in the Senate. And she consistently is a voice harking back to the proclamation of 1916. And I think for a lot of the women, we come back to that again and again and that promise of equality, that promise of a republic of equality. Despite the efforts to push them out of the public sphere and relegate all women to the home, many women campaigned on, especially in the area of social care. Some of their efforts paid off, and in 1935, the Irish government finally enacted legislation designed to provide financial assistance to all qualifying widows. So Orla, we have the 1935 Pension Act there introduced for the widows and orphans of Ireland. What difference did it make to them, do you think? I mean, was it a very generous scheme? It wasn't a very generous scheme. It was 10 shillings a week. But in a way, it was for many women a liberation from, you know, the hard slog that it was when they had to go from charity to charity to small job to small job to small job. It created a foundation whereby it was never going to be enough. Mm -hmm. And I think it was designed as such that it would never be enough and they'd have to supplement their income. But in a way, it created some kind of a solid basis whereby they, they could ensure that there was food on the table for their children. This, in many ways, is the culmination of those female voices and those female activists after the revolutionary period who continued to be activists, albeit in the realm of, 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 of social care in a way and social reform. This act is the state's demonstration of its recognition of what went before, but also of its responsibility to what will come afterwards in terms of supporting the most vulnerable, but in particular our, our widows and orphans in Irish society.
the executed leaders of the East Rising will always be icons of modern Irish history. But for the widows of the East Rising, their execution was slow. Their execution went on for years. And they carried with them through all of that their own personal grief and loss, their responsibility as, as lone parents, their responsibility for their own political commitment, which was really important to them. And then this additional responsibility as being almost surrogates for the symbolic presence of their husbands. These women's names should be as recognisable as their husbands. Lily Connolly, Kathleen Clark, Maud Gunn, Agnes Mallon, Anya Kant, Muriel McDonough and Grace Plunkett. They are hugely important figures in Irish history in their own right. As the role of women in the Irish Free State became increasingly contested, the not insignificant contribution of the Easter widows and other women like them was airbrushed out of history. The official record recording only the activities of their husbands and the other men who fought in the Rising. The new Ireland that their husbands' deaths helped to create turned out to not really have a place for the widows of 1916 after all. It didn't really have a place for many other women either. The promise of equality, as enshrined in the 1916 proclamation, became an ongoing and unfinished project that still continues to this day. When reflecting on her parents' role in history, Agnes Manon's daughter once wrote, I've often thought it was my mother who was the heroic one a different definition of heroic than that which we've come to associate with the 1916 Rising. But every bit is true when we consider the lives that these women lived, their sacrifices, resilience, and courage. Perhaps it was every bit as brave for the widows to keep on living for Ireland as it was for the men to die for it. Irish football legends and President Michael D. Higgins celebrate the centenary of Football Association of Ireland on The Late Late Show tomorrow from 9.35. Next this evening, visual artist Rachel Fallon features on The Works Presents.